Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together, we're The Minimalists. We're here with Malabama. Hi, everybody. TK Coleman. Beautiful day it is. Oh, we got the rest of our team here and a very special guest. She'll be joining us in a moment. Coming up today on this free public minimal episode, we're talking to a listener about avoiding clutter to create an organized home. Then our lightning round segment. We've got a question about home storage, a live stream question, and a listener tip for you. You can check out the full two-hour maximal edition of episode 390, where we answer five times the questions and we dive deep into several simple living segments. That private podcast episode is out right now at patreon.com slash The Minimalists. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free because advertisements suck. Let's start with our callers, y'all. If you have a question or comment for our show, give us a call, 406-219-7839, or email a beautiful voice recording straight from your phone to podcast at theminimalists.com. Our first question today is from Trinity. I'm Trinity from Eugene, Oregon. I've noticed when trying to style my space, I start feeling like I need to acquire decor and pieces that show that style. But then things start to feel cluttered. Is there a way to style my home without adding more possessions? Joining us in the studio today to help us tackle this question is Kristen Ziegler from Minima Online. Kristen is a professional organizer, and she understands better than anyone that the best way to organize your stuff is to get rid of most of it. Kristen, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy to be here. Oh, So let's talk to Trinity specifically. Quite often when we get a space, well, what do we feel compelled to do? We feel compelled to fill it with stuff and especially stuff that shows my personality, <laughs> right? And now you work with a lot of clients on their homes and I know people want to communicate their personality, but one of the worst ways to do that is by acquiring a bunch of things. How would you talk to Trinity if she came to you and your business and said, hey, I really need help with all of this clutter that I'm beginning to form in my life? Yeah, so I feel like authentic style can't be contrived. So um, I would just focus on identifying the things that are either useful or beautiful. And I would even go so far as to say necessary. So my um, my best solution is merge form and function. Even the necessary things are a chance for you to show your, I would say preferences and priorities is a better word than style, because I think that um, that gets at the authenticity of who you are as a person, which can't be contrived versus style to me is more of a surface level thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So when I think about my home or I think about someone else's home, quite often it tells me about who they are if there's a bunch of excess. Mm -hmm. And what I often tell people is when in doubt, subtract. Yes. It's not about adding more because like, oh, you know, it feels a little bit like me, but it's a little bit chaotic. Maybe if I add just a little bit more, a little here, a little there. And before you know it, you have all of this excess. Yeah. There isn't a whole lot of function. There's a lot of form. Yeah. And it just starts getting in the way. Yeah. So I feel like... um organization without minimizing is like form without function. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been reading this book called Subtract by Leedy Klotz. Have you heard of it? Yes. Yeah, I figured. Um, And I think there's such a missed opportunity through subtraction in, in problem solving. I think instinctually, like biologically, we go to adding. Even I, like we just moved in September and I even catch myself doing it. That space feels off. I need to add a picture. I need to add a vase. I need to add a thing. And every single time, this requires, the approach of subtraction requires a lot more time and patience. Mm. But I always tell my clients, there's no rush. It took me seven years to get our last house exactly how I wanted it. And that's, and then I moved. (laughs) 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 Time for a new project. That's another conversation. (laughs) So let me ask you with respect to someone like, like Trinity, if she does feel like, oh, this space feels a little empty. Now, obviously, Trinity, you are complete even in an empty room. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But if you walk into a room and you're like, oh, there's something off about this. It does feel empty. Yeah. What what kind of questions do you ask? Uh, So my architect brain um, wants to say, like, um, how can you possibly rearrange or reimagine the things that are already in the space? Uh Usually... I'll go big when something feels off in a space, like completely change it up and play and really let go of my attachments to the way it is. And usually 
the end result that feels balanced is really similar to where I started, but there's a few subtle tweaks that I discovered, which I couldn't have if I hadn't let go, let, let go and explore it a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know how interior designers like plan the whole space out and then do, I feel like there's so much magic in the, in the doing, mm-hmm. like the design build approach. Yeah. I love your observation that authentic style can't be contrived. And I was going to ask you, well, can you say more about that? And then you followed it up with saying, (laughs) focus more on what you prefer rather than on what seems stylish. And it sounds like you're saying, hey, what feels good? What functions well? Rather than what you think is going to look cool to someone else. Because you can't control that. You can't control that. Yeah, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. really nice. I'm, yeah. I am not an interior designer, but like I'm thinking about how I would approach <laughs> the situation. I mean, obviously, Trinity likes some stuff, you know, some decorations. Um, you can't have all the decorations, as Trinity pointed out, because then you feel overwhelmed. Yeah. Would it be a good approach? Like, I don't know, maybe set a boundary of like uh, a couple things and like see how those two things look in that room or even like maybe start with nothing. Just start with like a wall. Can you do an accent wall like painted or wallpapered or something. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of what they did back in the nineties when I worked for my dad, uh, <laughs> my dad's painting and wallpaper business. Yeah. It seems like you could add some things more intentionally rather than trying to put all the things in there. And yeah. And I think that goes back to the process of simplifying is identifying the things that really spark a feeling for you or add value to your life and working with those things. Mm. Um, but yeah, I always like to, um, bring plants into a space, like natural elements. Ooh, yeah. Um, I think you can have too many plants though, but. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, yeah. yeah well, definitely. <laughs> what, what I've noticed with the spaces, your own space mm-hmm. tends to be more minimal than maybe a lot of the people you work with. Than all of the people I work with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it could be that they don't have an aspiration necessarily to get down to the more stark level. Right. Um, yeah. And that's okay. I mean, Uh, Later in this episode, in fact, uh, Trinity, I'd love to send you, if you're not a Patreon supporter, every week on Fridays, we do a minimalist home tour. And this week, we are actually going to do, we're going to take a look at my living space. And it's really stark. It's even more stark than yours, but I don't prescribe that to anyone. And what I love about what you do is you're not prescribing that either. This is what's ideal for me, and it is one recipe. It's a template upon which you can add, you can subtract. And uh, when you work with people, you don't say, well, you need to get down to this particular no, level. absolutely not. Mm. So m- my company's name, Minima, is actually a calculus term. Um, I'm a huge math nerd, mm. and but I also love arts. So that's why I studied architecture. But Minima is the lowest value on a function curve. And so I always say, I want to help our clients get to their Minima. And that's different for everyone. I'm all the way down, I feel like, you know, and you're all the way like at the bottom of the curve. But <laughs> yeah. not everybody wants to be there. And I feel like, Even if I can impart a little bit of minimalist wisdom, I've done my job. I'm not going to say, well, you have failed and I fire you as a client because you kept too much stuff. I mean, (laughs) that's not helpful. So, Yeah. 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 Well, you know, it reminds me of those articles about CEOs who read one book a week. The lesson to be taken from that isn't to stress yourself out about reading as much as the CEOs, but like, hey. Maybe I could read more. Yeah, I'm inspired by this. I want to, you know, take a little bit from that and see how it can improve my life. So one question for you. So let's say with with Trinity's situation, maybe she has a chair or a Mm -hmm. picture, some cherished piece of furniture that really worked for the old place. Mm -hmm. She gets into the new place. And what if it just doesn't fit with the style of what she wants to do? Does she have to get get rid of it? Or what do you do? Um, I would give it some time. But I personally, I am very adaptive to the space that I live in. I think a lot of people have this idea about forcing uh, their needs or their you know, specific vision onto a space. I think the best um, result is when we look at our space and think about a harmonious relationship. Like, oh, this space has these beautiful windows. I don't want to block it, crowd it out with a bunch of clutter. Just kind of leaning in, asking the space what it wants to be. Mm. Um, Does this space uh, serve your purpose with that chair in it or not? Um, That's only something that she can figure out. Mm. Mm. It's interesting. Like, I don't really crave to put anything on the walls or, mm-hmm. and, and my wife is the same exact way. But it's funny, like, we'll get these things in our lives. Like, uh, her dad is an artist and he gave us like a couple of nice paintings of Montana. Um, Josh gave us an awesome picture of me and Mariah from 10 years ago. We're so old, dude. Anyway, 
Um, it was a beautiful picture, beautifully framed. Um, I had a friend who I did that sent me a painting, but like I get these things and I'm like, oh wow, like I'm compelled to mm-hmm. put this on the wall and find a spot for it. So then I kind of make it work with the room. We have a lot of plants in there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I wish I had that, that vision of what I wanted to do with my space. It's more like kind of people will offer me something and I'm like, oh yeah, I could totally see that like going up on the wall. That's beautiful. Or yeah. oh, no, thanks. Um, thanks for the offer though. Yeah. yeah. And so when someone like Ryan comes to you, Chris, and they're like, I just don't have the vision for this. I know mm-hmm. I really appreciate what you, how you've curated your space. And while I may not be that strict with my own space, I'm not able to curate my own vision how I even want this place to look. I've got certain things, things that I like, things that I've owned for a while. And some things may work in the space, some, some things not. What's your process of sort of going through the home? Yeah, um, so I feel like defining your vision, Mm -hmm. it's maybe not something you can always do from the outset. It requires a little bit of discovery and play and, and, you know, maybe putting that picture that was gifted up on the wall and then deciding that doesn't feel right. And what feels right to you might not feel right to someone else, Mm. but it only really matters if it feels right to you. Mm. I think just experimenting and playing and and not being afraid to put holes in the wall. Mm. It's just paint. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And just, just doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the experimentation piece is really important here because as soon as you set it, it's not set forever. It's not yeah. fixed. Nothing in life is, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and so you got to a uh, you you got to a end point with your space where you felt like it you had perfected it, mm-hmm. where it was done. Your, your space was done, and then you decide, well, it's time to move. <laughs> yeah. And the things that worked in that previous space, unless your new space looks nearly identical, nothing they, like it. Yeah, and so they may not work. Yeah. And so being willing to let go of those things we hold on to from the past, and they may have a sort of sentimental resonance with us. And so we hold on to them, even though they don't work anymore. Right. They've ceased to add value. In fact, quite often what happens when we hold on and it's getting in the way, it actually drains the value from our life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I also, yeah, I think it's really important to be able to let go of things during a move or as your life changes. Um, sometimes a fresh set of eyes too can kind of come in. If, if you're not sure, you could ask for feedback. <laughs> Take it or leave it. You know, mm-hmm. it's your space. Yeah. Um, I also look for pieces uh, that are flexible. So I invested in this hay sofa that I love. And I was really hoping it was going to fit into the new house. And the good news is that it did, but I was ready to sell it if it didn't. But it's modular. So mm-hmm. I could take a piece out of the middle and it could get smaller if it needed to. So things that are flexible, that are not so specific to a space, especially if it's more of an investment, yeah. are good things to look for. Yeah. I always call Josh. I'll just send him a picture. And be like, yeah. hey, does this look all right? Does this look okay? <laughs> Whether it's my outfit or like something I'm hanging on the wall or yeah. Like, can we do this for minimal uh, home tour? Is this a good picture? <laughs> Uh, next week, by the way, uh, I've seen some beautiful pictures of your previous home. Yeah. I'd love to feature that uh, for our patrons oh, as well. Yeah. So every week we do this this weekly minimalist home tour. Our patrons will send in things. In fact, last week we had the most beautiful kitchen I've ever seen. Was it? I think it was in Estonia. It's pretty it's gorgeous. Yeah. It was amazing. But the art was the view from the kitchen. Yeah. I mean, it was like as soon as you, you saw out the window... And uh, for someone like Ryan, who doesn't want to put a bunch of things on the wall, or someone like me or my wife, Bex, we don't put anything on the walls generally. And and I, I think that's that allows us to keep it simple mm-hmm. because we feel compelled to constantly, as soon as you have a blank wall, I should fill this with something. Mm-hmm. But then when I see a space like your space, mm-hmm. there's plenty of blank walls and it doesn't yeah. look empty. It looks calm. It looks peaceful. It looks stunning. Thank you. And when I see someone's home with a whole bunch of things on the wall, it can be intentional. It can be well curated. Mm -hmm. But more often than not, it's just like, hey, I need to throw something up here. Yeah. And then it just becomes clutter. It's not intentional. Um, So... I feel like, so I identify as very visually sensitive. I, I'm sure some some of he, y'all here do as well. <laughs> yeah. Have you heard of highly sensitive? Yeah, my, my wife's a highly sensitive person. So is my daughter. So am I. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and it manifests itself largely in the visual sense. So I have an uncle who I wrote about in your class, actually, oh, okay. who's a total maximalist. And I can appreciate his space because that's what works for him. That's the amount of things that feel right for his sensitivity. Mm. But for me, I couldn't live that way because mm. it would stress me out. But that's literally just how I'm, like my physio- physiology mm. is wired. Yeah, I think about my, my mom. She was a maximalist, but mm-hmm. she had a great style. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think of people like Axel Vavort, who's a great interior designer. And 
but he's a he, he really appreciates objects more than I do. There, yeah. There's a lot of form there, and they may not have a particular function, but they have an aesthetic value and a beauty to him that it's really hard to pull off if you're just willy-nilly grabbing random objects. Yeah. You could tell he's not doing it. There's something intentional behind it. My mom did the same thing. She had a lot of stuff, but it was intentional. And I applaud that. If you're being intentional with very few things or you're being intentional with a lot of things, Mm -hmm. it's not going to stress you out because you are constantly questioning the objects in your home. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's actually more of a challenge to create beauty with less but I love the challenge. Mm. Um, I think it's easier to make a space feel complete by adding, but I thrive from, from asking myself how few things can I have? Because for me, it's less to maintain. It's less money to spend, um, less decisions. Decision fatigue is real. That's part of minimalism for me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think that you know, again, going back to the beginning of our conversation, our home is a manifestation of our inner world. Wow. And it can be beautifully curated in a maximalist way or a minimalist way or somewhere in between. But yeah, for me, I've learned that um, the maximalist would stress me out. You, <laughs> so often help, me. Yeah. you often help people unpack their homes as well. Mm-hmm. I assume that's during a move yep. where someone's moving and it's like, I don't even know what to do with all this stuff. Yeah. Now, when you're unpacking, do you quite often get rid of most of the things that are being unpacked? I don't know about most. I think the percentage probably varies client to client, but it's such a great opportunity. You have to touch the thing anyway. Like, let's decide if it's going to go in your mm-hmm. cabinet or closet or out the door with us. Yes. So. Yeah, and it's not about you getting rid of their stuff. No. It's about them making that decision. Yeah. And maybe you can ask the questions that facilitate That's just it, yes. the letting go. So so much of our work is just asking the right questions. Mm. We can't tell someone what's right or wrong for them. We can just find the right questions to ask. Do you have yeah. some of your favorite questions you see come up again and again with clients? Oh, yeah. So, um, gosh, I have a whole list in a blog post. Um, I think, do you love this thing? It, are you keeping it because you should keep it? Do you have another thing that could serve the same purpose? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like with, it depends on the category too. Like with clothing, does it fit? Do you love it? Does it suit your current lifestyle? Or is it part of like some past corporate career that you're not in anymore? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and just also like asking the space, what does it want to be? And respecting the boundaries of that space. Like, okay, we've minimized based on these factors, but it doesn't fit. So we need to do another pass so that you can live comfortably here. Yeah. I love that because yeah, everyone has different preferences. In fact, some people, because of the paradox of choice, they want a list of all the things they should have. Yeah. And asking those questions, it's, you're really helping that person discover their own preferences. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah. it's such a huge discovery process. Um, I have a client who started working with us um, to declutter her home and um, she did that. And then a couple, she's become a good friend. And a couple years later, she called me up and she's like, um, our work together has finally inspired me to get my finances in order because I had that clarity. And then a couple years later, she said, I'm finally getting my health in order. And I've, I've created a capsule wardrobe because everything's in flux. So I need it to be really simple. And I was like, that's amazing. Yeah. Just the way that it has a ripple effect. And yeah. That's well, cool. That willingness to let go. Mm-hmm. when repeated and it becomes habitual, not that you should make it a habit, but if you let go, you let go, you keep asking those questions. I remember when I first started letting go, I asked the same question over and over with every object mm-hmm. until it became a feeling, not just an intellectual exercise. Exactly. And that question was, does this thing add value to my mm-hmm. life? Mm-hmm. And I asked that, does this thing add value to my life? Does this thing add value to my life? Does this thing add va-? And the more I asked it, I could just start to look at an object and know like, Immediate. oh no, yeah, yeah. that's excess. Yeah. yeah. Same. Trinity, thank you so much for your question. Ryan. What's up? What time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your questions from TikTok. Yes, indeed. You can follow The Minimalist on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Minimalists. Now, during the lightning round, we each have 60 seconds to answer your question with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. We have a question right now from Michael. There are so many container options, plastic totes, canvas containers, bankers boxes, and so on. When keeping things organized, how do you decide on the best container for the job? Kristen, I'm going to set you up here. Give me 60 seconds, Professor Sean, and uh, I'll set you up for this lightning round. You don't have to be super pithy, but just something within 60 seconds here for Michael. Michael, 
the best way to organize your stuff is to get rid of most of it. You got a lot of things in your home, in your basement, in your garage, in your attic, in your kitchen, in your cabinets, in your closets, in your entertainment console. You've got a lot of stuff. Instead of simply trying to organize it with more plastic totes, more canvas containers, more banker's boxes and printer paper boxes, consider getting rid of most of it. And then when you finally reach that end point, what do you have? You have a few things that might, might require a plastic tote or might require some sort of canvas box to put it in. But you're going to need far fewer things to organize if you have far fewer things to organize. Mm. Kristen, what say you? All right. So to play off of that... um... Go for it. (laughs) (laughs) To follow up from that, I would say when you have done that, you get to spend a little bit more time thinking about what containers are going to work best for you. Mm -hmm. And what I would suggest is thinking about how is this solution going to still serve me and my space five or 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. So I look for things when I need a container that are modular and versatile and interchangeable. Mm -hmm. So my personal favorite is from Muji, which is a Japanese brand. And I have the same containers in the kitchen, in the home office closet, in the linen closet. And as our needs inevitably change, we can take a container from one space and swap it out in another. And we don't have to keep buying and things don't fall apart and become disorganized again. Mm. What I love about that is it's really simple. And the containers you're using, they're not going to be super bright colors. Not there's anything wrong with that but having this baseline for organization so that you're not constantly having to update. Yeah. Five, 10 years from now, these will still likely work for me. And if they don't work, then of course you can let the containers go as well. Yeah. Let's get 60 seconds on the clock for Ryan Nicodemus. Let's do it. TK, no one wins with storage bins. (laughs) 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 Let me, let me expound a little bit. When it comes to storage bins, if a professional organizer shows up the very first day, with storage bins. What is that going to do for that for that client? It's going to give them permission to hold on to more. Right away, they're like, oh, there's some more stuff to hold on to. So no one wins with storage bins also means no one really wants to have storage bins. Who is like, oh, I'm so glad I bought these storage bins. They look so awesome. We can get them to look as pretty as possible. And there are some really well-designed ones out there, but no one feels good about the storage bins that they own. Mm, oh, that's so mm. spot on. Because here's the thing, you would rather... A hundred percent of the time, not need the storage bins. And you rather, if you need the thing that's in the storage bins, you would prefer if it just materialized when you needed it mm-hmm. and then you didn't have to put it away or store it. But it is true. Sometimes we have to store some things, but if you show up first with a pile of storage bins, you're going to store way too many things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, TK Coleman with 60 seconds on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> the best option is the one that sets you free. Mm. What's the definition of having options? It means there are more possibilities on the table than what you are capable of taking advantage of. So how do you downsize that sense of overwhelm that comes from having so many opportunities before you? You simply choose freedom. Mm -hmm. It's like I tell my students when they say, hey, TK, what's the best book to buy? The one you'll actually read. Mm -hmm. If you buy the books that you think will make you look smart, they won't do you any good if they remain on the shelf In the same way, if you exercise the options that make you look good, it's not going to do anything for you if those options aren't actually used and if they aren't leveraged in order to make you free. Oh, spot on, man. Mm. Because what's going to happen is I can go to Walmart or the container store or wherever. And we just had a whole conversation on the private podcast about storage bins and, and excess stuff going in these bins. I'm giving myself not just permission to hide the excess I have now, but to accumulate even more excess because at least it's well-organized excess. But well-organized excess is still excessive. Mm. We're going to check in with the Patreon live stream in a moment, Alabama. But first, real quick, for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of The Minimalists. Well, it's a brand new month. This episode comes out on the first of the month. And guess what? That means it's a new opportunity to play the 30-day minimalism game. A lot of people feel overwhelmed. They don't know where to start when they start to let go. They look around their home and they say, oh, I've got 300,000 items in here. I'm just going to throw my hands up. I don't know what to do. Well, 
if you're anything like me, it, it, decluttering is kind of boring. I, I don't like decluttering, but it's essential for many of us to get the excess out of the way. So we found a way to make it a bit more fun with some friendly competition. And the way the 30-day minimalism game works, you can find all the details at theminimalists.com slash game. It's completely free to play. We don't want anything from you for that. You can download our free minimalism game calendar there as well. But you partner up with a friend, a family member, a coworker at the beginning of the month. And you say on the first day of the month, we're each going to get rid of one item. Starts off really easy. Anyone can pick just one item. You can pick, Ryan usually just picks one paperclip on the first day of the month. <laughs> Second day of the month, two paperclips. Right. And by the end of the month, I've gotten rid of almost 500 paperclips. <laughs> yeah, the, the sad part is on the 31st of each month, he goes buys more paperclips so he can play this game. Yeah. Cheating. <laughs> and the beauty about the game is you get to set the rules. Whoever goes the longest throughout the month wins. So first day of the month, you I'm going to get rid of this shirt. Second day of the month, I'm going to get rid of this uh, pair of pants and uh, wait a minute actually let me get a pair of these shoes i think that counts as two things one shoe two shoe okay great however you want to count it go for it it starts to get difficult by the middle of the month because day 13 you're like i have to get rid of 13 things a day and 14 things tomorrow Uh uh-oh what am i going to get rid of whoever goes the longest wins so you bet whatever you want at the beginning of the month and if you both make it to the end of the month then you've both won because as ryan just said you've gotten rid of about 500 items and that's a really great place to get started if you want to download the free minimalism game calendar it's over at the minimalists.com slash game we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well malabama let's check in with the patreon live stream any comments for us we have a comment here from crystal she says the richmond meetup group sends our love to kz Aww. thank you crystal. That's awesome. <laughs> so back in uh 2014 we we went to a hundred different cities and left behind a hundred free local meetup groups over at minimalist.org. And that's what she's referencing there. So uh, if you want to find open-minded people who are also decluttering their lives in different ways, whether it's decluttering their home, decluttering their finances, decluttering their relationships, minimalist.org is a great place to find and connect with people locally. We'll check back in with the live stream here in a bit. But Alabama first, what else you got for us? Here's a minimalist insight from one of our listeners. My name is Chris Urban, and I'm a computer tech calling in from Chico, California. You guys mentioned cloud storage as an option, which is great for some. I personally dislike cloud storage because I never want to risk my personal privacy if there was a security issue with the cloud service. I'll be facing sorting my own digital files this month, and we'll be doing it with two hard drives, which will be the same model of size, and will be in RAID 1. Without going into too much detail, RAID 1 is a way to set up hard drives to be mere images of each other. Every time a file is added to one, it goes to the other also. It appears as one drive in the operating system. If one drive fails, the other will still have the data. It's a great way to back up important data and avoid the cloud. I realize this sounds very complicated, but it really isn't. Search online for how to set up RAID 1, and I am sure you will find plenty of guides. All right, y'all, that's our minimal episode for today. We'll see you on Patreon for the full two-hour maximal edition of episode 390, which includes answers to a bunch more questions like, How would you recommend storing small kitchen gadgets and appliances? How can I organize my home workspace when I have to share the room with the rest of my family? I heard you guys discuss contaminants in your tap water. How do you filter your water? Plus a million more questions for Kristen and the minimalists. Also this week, a private tour of my stark but peaceful 250 square foot living space and much, much more of less. And if you want to hear all that, check out the Minimalist Private Podcast at patreon.com slash the minimalist or click the link in the description to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You also gain immediate access to all of our podcast archives all the way back to episode 001. And if you're still on the fence, here's a testimonial from one of our lovely Patreon supporters. Jessica says, Hey, I've been following you guys for a while. I knew someone was following us, Ryan. (laughs) (laughs) I thought you were just being paranoid. (laughs) She says, I've been following you guys for a while, but I am a new Patreon subscriber. Your private podcast is as refreshing as a cold drink in the heat. Thank you for bringing meaning into my life, not just through your minimalist lifestyle, but through your wisdom 
and thought-provoking private conversations. Wow. Jessica, big thanks to you. Also, big thanks to Kristen Ziegler from MinimaOnline.com. Ladies and gentlemen, Kristen Ziegler. Yeah. <laughs> All right, y'all. If you leave here today with just one message, please let it be this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Peace. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'll be fine without it